Welcome to the Good Chris Sophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. For our talk this week, we're listening to an exhortation that was given by Brother Simon DeCosson at the beginning of July, just this past year, as part of the Simi Hills live stream. And in his exhortation, which is titled Spiritual Rehabilitation, Brother Simon is looking at the concept of time, and more specifically in his situation uh, during the pandemic that has been going on, he has had an excess of time and what to do with that additional time that he's been given, uh, especially right now with with every day seeming to be the same for some people, it can be easy to lose track of what you're going to do each day and feel like you're just sitting around waiting for things to happen. Uh, so for his exhortation, Brother Simon is taking a look at the restoration of Israel uh, when they are restored after they have been carried away into captivity to Babylon, and then how to make the scripture and the story of Israel real and applicable to our lives. Uh, I know for myself personally, with everything that's been going on with the pandemic, I have felt like I have had less time. Uh, my job was able to transition to remote, which I am very thankful for, but uh, has made everything seem busier for me. And it was a refreshing perspective for myself to hear it from the perspective of somebody who isn't that busy and what this time can be like. So I wanted to share this exhortation because I thought it was a good perspective for a viewpoint that isn't my own, which is kind of the point of these podcast is to try to get as many perspectives on things as possible for everyone. Uh, and also, I thought it would be an encouraging one. Brother Simon is a, a younger brother uh, who is doing a fantastic job, and it was very encouraging to hear him give his words. So I uh, wanted to make sure we shared this one with you. Uh, as always, please continue to send in the, the recommendations. I know there have been a lot of different uh, online uh, youth weekends and Bible schools and things that have been going on over the summer. I uh, haven't been able to attend all of them. So if you heard any classes or anything on any of those, please, please do send those in. We're always appreciative of any sort of recommendations or suggestions that you can send in. And so with that, we will turn it over to our brother Simon DeCoston for his exhortation, Spiritual Rehabilitation. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you for the invitation to share an exhortation with you this morning. Under any other circumstances, I would readily be able to give you the love and greetings of the Verdugo Hills Ecclesia, but excluding the few of us that are here this morning, uh, I haven't seen everyone in a long time. I am able to share the love and greetings from my own family, though. It's very nice being here and being able to share some thoughts with you this morning. It's July now, which means that a lot of us have been staying home for around four months. I can't speak to how this quarantine has affected all of us, as I'm sure we've all been impacted in a variety of unique ways. But I can speak about my family's experiences and how I've been affected. At this stage of my life, I'm still a student, and back in March, my school went fully online. My summer job prospect has fallen through, and in the fall, I'm going to continue, uh, I'm going to continue school by sitting in my bedroom and watching virtual lectures until the semester ends in December. Many of the other young people in the Vertigo Hills Ecclesia are facing a similar change. My parents' jobs have been affected, and elsewhere in the Brotherhood, I've heard of handfuls of firings, furloughs, and for those people who do continue to work, perhaps there's not enough work to be done right now. Loved ones have been separated across borders, and even for those who live nearby, health concerns have prevented visits to grandparents and others who are in the high-risk category. I say all these things to summarize some of the difficulties that we're facing right now in the Brotherhood. There's fear in the uncertainty of it all. Right when things appear to be getting better, we're seeing a relapse in numbers and our hope falls. I dare say there's no way for us to know when things will return to being completely normal, or even if we will be fully able to comprehend what has been going on in the world and how our lives have been affected from those things. 
The plans that we once had and were excited about have been canceled, and instead, all we've been left with is time. For most of us, there's no shortage of time, and that's something worth considering. I don't want to dwell on the unrest of the world for too long, but it should, it should be descriptive enough for me to say that all of us have been directly affected by the things that have been happening in the world so far. Even if the effect on our lives has been something small, like being required to wear a mask at work or in public, and to keep our distance from other people, those are still big changes, and the inability to interact with people as freely as we once did can be both scary and saddening. But as I've alluded to already, perhaps the biggest change of our day-to-day -day life has been the amount of time that we have. Personally, I've been drowning in free time ever since my school has gone online four months ago. And as more things in the summer are canceled, all of us are facing unprecedented amounts of free time. If our instinct might have once been to drive to a friend's house and spend all of our spare time with them, maybe the opinion on this one is still changing, but for a while now, doing something like that has been out of the question for most of the quarantine up to this point. For all of these reasons, I thought it would be appropriate for our topic this morning to be about time. A lot of us have more time than we've ever had before, and rather than just looking at the subject of time abstractly, I'd like to consider how we use that time, how we've used it so far in quarantine, and how we should use it until things start returning to the way they were, or if Christ returns first. For all of us, I'm sure being stuck at home has been hard. If you're a social person and your normal routine involves a lot more interaction with other people, like people in the ecclesia, at school, or other co-workers, understandably, quarantine has been a trial. There are other reasons that being locked down at home might be challenging as well. There may be fear in not having a steady source of income for the brothers and sisters whose jobs have been gravely affected. And perhaps above all else in quarantine, there's the fear of getting sick. If my understanding of the situation is correct, the virus is still very much not understood, and the best treatment of all at this point is to just avoid getting it. I understand if fear is one of the first emotions that you feel, living through the problems that we see today. But despite all that fear and hopelessness that might feel instinctive or natural at a time like this, the quarantine has been an incredible blessing in a lot of ways. Now, if it's hard to see that in your own circumstances, I hope that my exhortation can change your perspective about what we've gone through up to this point. Keep in mind in all the things that happen to us that God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with temptation he will also provide you the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Elsewhere, we're also encouraged that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. Therefore, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Nobody was prepared to be locked up and kept apart from their families, both physical and spiritual families, for so long. Nobody expected that, and we've all endured through it up to this point. What I'd like to remind us that the trials we experience now are there to help build our character. When we're cut off from our brothers and sisters, we're stuck at home. Do we still read the Bible if no one is there to read it with us aloud in person, like we do in meeting? If we can't gather in person like we used to, does it mean that we're sort of off the hook for the week and we can just wait out however many Sundays go by until we meet again? without remembering Jesus? From a spiritually sluggish point of view, maybe that's what our instinct or our response to this situation has been. But that's not how it should be. Instead, I'd like to bring our attention to the idea that this abundance of free time is a blessing. It's truly a gift from God if you look at it from the right perspective. I referenced James's letter earlier when I read that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. But right before he says that, James begins his letter by saying, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. 
It might be hard to see through the negatives, but James' words ring so true in our quarantine trials as well. There is reason to be joyful. There is reason to give thanks to God for all this time he's given us. Think about the reasons why. When else in your life have you been advised to stay home, to stay away from the noise and busyness of the world, and to take a break from the things that suffocate our spiritual lives? I admit there are disadvantages to the things that we're facing right now. But looking at our trials through the lens of spiritual growth, God has given us more uninhibited time every day to pray to him, to study his word, and to speak about our hope with friends over a phone call or writing letters to people who are in need in the brotherhood. The additional hours of free time that we're looking at every day are not meant to be an opportunity for us to spend it all on entertainment or to fritter and waste all that valuable life or pleasures of the world. This free time shouldn't be a way for us to satisfy our flesh. Instead, I hope that we can understand that this is a precious gift from God as a period of spiritual meditation and rehabilitation. If your spiritual life has been weak recently, if it was weak coming into quarantine, or it has become weaker without the benefit of seeing our brothers and sisters, I want to encourage all of us to redeem the time. Let's use it wisely. Personal prayers shouldn't be the 30-second recitations that you say before you eat food. God has given us time to cut from our lives the influences that eat away at our faith, to cut those bad things out, and instead to spend that time by falling on our knees and speaking to God of our feelings and our concerns. We ought to give him thanks for what he has done, and to ask for help in the ways that we are struggling. If, as a student or an employee, your life felt choked of any time or opportunities to get closer to God, if you were overburdened by deadlines and expectations, now burdens of that kind have been relieved ever so slightly, and God has given us the breathing room that we need to be refreshed, to turn to him in prayer. Right now, we no longer have an excuse to say something like, if only I had enough time. Time is all we're looking at these days, and it's now a responsibility to use it appropriately. Again, I I can't guarantee that everyone in the audience, wherever they might be from, I can't guarantee that everyone has an abundance of free time because of the lockdown. But even in the case of those whose work lives are just as busy as they used to be before, I hope our considerations this morning are helpful in reminding us of how we should spend spare time whenever we have it. Now, hand in hand with the idea of time, I'd like to shift our discussion this morning towards the ideas of spiritual growth or spiritual rehabilitation. These are some ideas that I want to talk about as a great alternative way to be spending our free time, recognizing that each and every day we have the opportunity to grow and become more spiritually mature. It isn't the kind of development that only happens on Sundays. It takes a lot of stress off your mind to frame the unfortunate things that we're going through as a positive experience or an opportunity for growth, rather than focusing on the negative ways that we've been affected. To be rehabilitated is to be restored to health through training and therapy after an illness. In Jeremiah, we read that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The thing that I'd like to take away from Jeremiah's comment here is that he says that human hearts are sick. He knows that human nature tends towards wickedness. And that's a struggle that we will forever wrestle with until our bodies and our nature are changed. Using that verse and that new understanding about human nature from Jeremiah, the idea of spiritual rehabilitation is a pretty powerful concept. We are sick. We struggle with disobedience and wickedness. And if there is any way for us to be rehabilitated or nursed back to spiritual health and oneness with God, that is the course that we ought to pursue. 
The time that we've uncovered in quarantine is a great opportunity for meditation and self-reflection. God has presented us with the time and the means to approach him. And now that we have the time and the means to draw near to him, the next move is on us. It's our responsibility now to examine ourselves and to cut out the bad habits that drag us down and to, in the place of those old habits, create new ones. Let's look at a few biblical examples that give us an idea of what spiritual growth or rehabilitation looks like. For the first example, let's consider the restoration of the people of Israel back into their land under the guidance of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, to set the stage first, before we look at Nehemiah chapter 8, let's remember the captivity of Israel and Judah. Because of their disobedience, both the kingdoms of Israel and Judah had been sacked by foreign invaders. Israel being attacked and taken by the Assyrians at an earlier time, and Judah being besieged and captured by the Babylonians at a later date. For generations before, God had sent his prophets to warn his people, both in Israel and in Judah, to repent and change their ways. I'm generalizing here, but of course we know that the people were stubborn and they didn't take heed to the warnings and exhortations of the prophets. They were urged to change, and when they had rejected God's word and killed his prophets, finally the two kingdoms were taken by foreign invaders. It's easy to be remorseful after you've been punished for your faults. That's something that we can all relate to. The 137th Psalm gives us an insight into the sadness the people of Judah experienced in their captivity. They lived in a land of idolaters, in a land of foreign gods and people who did not know the true God of Israel. For these reasons, the people of Judah wept by the rivers of Babylon and thought of how good their life had been in the protection and care of their Father in heaven. The psalm reads, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? This passage gives us an idea of the perpetual sorrow the captives in Babylon must have experienced. They knew there was a better land from which they had been taken, and they remembered in anguish that it was for their stubbornness and their faults that they had been removed from it. The people of Judah dwelt in Babylon as captives for 70 years until the proclamation came from Cyrus that they could return and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so, with that introduction, we come into the events of Ezra and Nehemiah. I consider the events that happen in Ezra and Nehemiah a really wonderful illustration of our topic this morning, of the idea of spiritual rehabilitation. The land had been desolate compared to what it once had been. Jerusalem itself was in shambles. The walls were broken, and it lay there defenseless. And so it was with the minds of the people, too. Their spirits were crushed from the challenges of living in a foreign land and being assimilated to their pagan culture. The fortress of their mind was broken into, just as Jerusalem lay there pillaged. Their faith was weakened by the poisonous impact of the world around, And now, more than ever, they needed to be rehabilitated, to be nursed back to health and a relationship with their father. In these two books of history, we see life breathed into the land once again, and the temple in Jerusalem is rebuilt. I understand that there's quite a lot of not-so-good stuff that happens in these books as well, like when both Ezra and Nehemiah have to separately rebuke the people for intermarrying with the people of the land. But nevertheless, there is a beautiful passage in Nehemiah chapter 8 that I think is worthy of our time to consider this morning. Ezra was a scribe, and he had in his possession a copy of the Law of Moses. I'm having to read in between the lines a little bit with what I'm about to share, 
But to my understanding, we aren't specifically told if the people as captives had access to their law while they were in Babylon. I would assume they didn't have access to their law because of their reaction to hearing it read in chapter 8. Let's take a look and consider their reaction to hearing it being read in their midst. Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been built specifically for that purpose, and he read among them from early morning to midday. So now I'm reading from Nehemiah chapter 8 and beginning at verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Skipping a verse. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. For one thing, I'm struck from this passage with the respect and reverence the returned captives had for the word of God. I'm imagining the multitudes that gathered to hear Ezra read to them, and when he began, the people stood. It says earlier in verse 3 that all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. I find that encouraging. The people had a great attitude. They had an opportunity for divine learning and correction, and they respected that opportunity, listening diligently to Ezra speak and having the words expounded to them. This was different than their rejection of the prophets before the captivity. The most stunning part of this passage, and sort of the reason that I've brought us here, we find in the response of the people to the words that they had heard. Verse 9 of Nehemiah chapter 8 reads, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. I find that very moving because, if you think about it, the word of God had worked so powerfully on the people that heard it that they were moved to tears. I can only imagine that this is because they came to an understanding of their faults and they were sorrowful for what their behavior had been like. And powerful as their emotion was, they were reminded that repentance is more than just emotion. Repentance requires action. Repentance is change, and it smiles at the fact that God is so immeasurably merciful in his dealings with us. For that reason, Nehemiah and Ezra told the people to be joyful. It's as if to say, don't dwell on the mistakes you've made in the past. Rejoice and be happy that now you know God's purpose, and you are better able to live a life that glorifies him. I want to apply what we've read in Nehemiah to what we're going through right now in quarantine. The people of Nehemiah's day had not meditated enough. They did not consider their ways enough. It took until Ezra read from God's word, expounding it to them in their ears through the span of a day, that they understood and reflected on their own lives. Of course, they were dissatisfied and they mourned because they realized their mistakes. And yet, they were encouraged. Not to be sad, but they were encouraged to be joyful for God's enduring grace. I want to encourage all of us to look at our experiences in quarantine as an excellent opportunity for self-reflection. In the case of the captives who had been removed from the evils of Babylon, the reflection was made all the more powerful by hearing God's word. My hope for all of us is to understand how similar our situation is to theirs. We have the opportunity to draw our minds out of Babylon, to return to spiritual thinking, the thinking that pleases God. Just as with the captives, scripture and prayer will aid us in considering our ways. With all the abundant time that we now seem to have, what better opportunity do, do we have but to read the word and reflect today? Change can start now. We can redeem the time and appreciate the fact that God has given us a way to draw near to him, all the while severing our ties with the world. 
it's pretty easy for me to stand up here and to abstractly recommend reading scripture. This is one of those times where spiritual growth as an idea and starting, ha- starting good habits is something that's a lot easier said than done. Right now, I'd like to take a little bit of time to shift our thoughts to making scripture more real to us. If we understand that the Bible is a practical book and written for our times, as well as for others throughout history, we're in a much better place to learn from it and to respect it. The way I'd like to make scripture real to us is to consider the Gospel of Mark. In Romans, Paul writes that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. That's a powerful verse, especially if you ever wonder why we try to make a habit of reading the Bible every day. Paul plainly says that it was written for our instruction. It was written for you and me and the faithful who have already lived and those who will understand the truth sometime in the future. That's a fundamental concept to grasp before we move on. So now, as I mentioned earlier, let's consider the gospel as recorded by Mark. I'd like to spend a short amount of time here to try to make scripture real in our lives. When you compare Mark to the other gospels, it might be surprising to notice how bald it is and that there seems to be significantly less detail in the other gospels. For one thing, you might notice that Mark is only 16 chapters whereas the other three records have at least five more. It's the shortest of the Gospels. But despite Mark being a somewhat shorter book of the Bible, in contrast with the other Gospels, Mark, as an author, takes a very interesting stylistic approach to recording the life of Jesus. Keep in mind that it's generally agreed among scholars that his Gospel was also written first, and in that sense, it's sort of the most straightforward and sequential of the four. You can imagine that because it was first, it served a very simple purpose. It brought the teaching of Jesus and the hope of the kingdom to a wider audience than Jesus himself could bring the message to. Now, what I find fantastic about Mark's gospel is his use of the present tense of speech. I've read somewhere that Mark uses the present tense 151 different places in his gospel, You might find yourself reading through a chapter in Mark when suddenly, in the English, the grammar seems bizarre, almost unnatural. I should note before we take a look at some examples of what I'm talking about, that some translations of the Bible, like the ESV and the New American Standard, these newer translations ignore the awkward present tense and instead they just represent the verse as being written completely in the past tense. If you were to read one of these newer versions, the dramatic grammatical effect might be lost, but the lesson still applies. When Mark was writing his gospel, he chose to write in the present tense, weaving in some active and present sentences along with the rest, which are in the past tense. He does this to make it real to the reader. Let's think about some examples that stick out to me in the later chapters of Mark particularly as we draw nearer to the account of Jesus' crucifixion. As I said before, some newer versions of the Bible take out the contradicting tenses. So I'm going to be reading a few verses from chapter 15, and I'll take that from the King James Version, because the King James Version preserves the present tense. Starting at verse 20, we're jumping right into the time of the crucifixion. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they, present tense, compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they, present tense, bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, and he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. 
and the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they, present tense, crucify two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. That was a lot of verses all at once, and if you're wondering what I mean by all of this present tense stuff, let me try to make it a little bit simpler. In the last example from that chunk of verses, it says, and with him they crucify two thieves. The interesting thing is that's not how our grammar works. Mark was written as a historical account. It should be written in the past tense. Jesus was crucified thousands of years ago. It should say they crucified, past tense, but it does not say that. The conclusion that I draw from all of this is that Mark wants to put the reader in Jesus' shoes. Every present tense verb in that passage relates to how we can die with Christ. The present tense words make us visualize someone carrying a cross, brought to the site of the crucifixion, and finally they are crucified today in the present. Mark wants us to see it, if not to live it in our own lives. The words compel us to bear our cross, our burden in life. Our trials presently bring us to the hill, and now we are crucified. Paul offers some incredible words of wisdom touching on this idea. First, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, these moving verses that I hope are already known to us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Just as Mark brings his reader to experience the crucifixion in the present, as if you and me, as if when we were reading we were crucified, so also Paul says that we must bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, that his life should also be made known among us. Another great verse, and one that's even more straight and to the point, Paul says the same thing. He exhorts to presently bear the burden of Christ's suffering in our own lives. And we read that in Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This morning, we've considered the idea of spiritual rehabilitation. I encourage all of us to look at quarantine as a time for reflection and a time for growth. We've considered that the Bible is here for us to learn and improve our character, not to gather dust on a shelf. We've seen the example of the captives returning to the land in Ezra and Nehemiah. They were drawn out of the world and were encouraged by Ezra to turn to God again. The same opportunity exists for us to save our minds from the things of the world and to dedicate our thoughts to God. Lastly, we've taken a look at Mark to make scripture more real for us. Our brother Mark has written his account of Jesus under the inspiration of God to bring us into the last moments before Jesus was crucified. Mark powerfully brings us to that scene and reminds us that we ought to put, the flesh, put our flesh to death presently we are baptized once, and symbolically we die only once. Yet continually throughout our lives, we have the opportunity to triumph over sin and put it to death whenever we can. We gather every Sunday to remember Jesus, to consider his death and to rejoice in his resurrection. Jesus Christ took the time to reflect on his life along his journey. We read in several different places of instances that he removed himself from his disciples or crowds and went into a mountain to pray, to grow closer to God and to become more focused against his own human will. Jesus is our example in this way, as he is our example in so many others. Our Savior has set the example of meditation and reflection 
And I hope that we can all learn from what he's shown us. In this quarantine, God has given us time to pause and consider, to grow and to mature. He's given us the opportunity to take time out of our busy lives and ask ourselves the question, what is important to me? That line of thinking puts us on the important path of reflection and one that I hope brings us to be spiritually rehabilitated. I hope to see all of you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash gct. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.